Okay, so you want to invest in an in individual company. What do you do? Yeah, there's only there's only two things. Choosing when to buy is is half of the <laughs> half of the package. But a much more difficult thing, I think, for most investors is trying to decide when when should you sell. Why do you think that you can beat the market? For most people, it's not the right choice. Most people don't have the time to do it. Most people don't have the skills to do it. Tesla is one of the companies in my portfolio. In my model, I'll be looking at. So let's say you're invested in a relatively small portfolio. Ten, ten is relatively small, right? Yeah. That's two hundred hours a quarter for you. The most undervalued factor in all of this. If you don't do your own homework, what are you doing? Right, very excited for this conversation. Joining us today, Sasha Yanshin, my YouTube friend slash nemesis. <laughs> Competitor. Yeah, and therapist. <laughs> you get me through the dark times, we talk a lot. Um, but also probably one of the smartest people I've ever met. And, and That's very you, kind. You know, it's okay. You need to meet more people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got you on today. I suggested that you come on because you invest in individual companies. I've seen your process and I want to communicate to people what the work that they should be doing if they want to invest in companies, individual companies, because you know, I preach about a global index and I think we see a lot of people just diving into individual companies without actually really understanding what they need to do. So we're going to talk about that. Can we just start first of all, by talking a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. And, and kind of how it's, how that suits your ability to buy individual companies. I, I studied maths at university. And then I kind of applied for a bunch of different jobs, not knowing what I wanted to do and ended up in uh, retail banking. So I worked at some big American banks in various different roles and like risk management and uh, building valuation models, that kind of stuff. Then I um, pro progressed and worked in a few different jobs that are not worth covering in any detail and energy, a few other things. You were just on the board for phones for you. No, no small thing at the age of like 30. It was a bit before that, but. Humble brag, let's go. And after that, um, in 2014 is when I started my consulting business. So that was a strategy consulting firm um, called Strategy Desk, where I worked with the banks. We did quite well. So we began working with a lot of uh, banks and our services companies probably worked with the vast majority of the banks in the UK and large financial services companies worked a lot in the US worked in the Middle East quite a bit in Asia yeah so our work was twofold we helped banks launch in new jurisdictions or launch new products that, that kind of stuff so that's kind of one half of the work and the other half of the work was um, mergers and acquisitions mostly in finance and um, bit in tech you know a big bank wants to acquire a mid-sized bank or a credit card company or something they would come to us and we would value the business for them. Um, and, and that's combining the valuation skills with the, the, sort of the, the, the knowledge of the industry and knowledge of the inside of how these products work and how to best value what you should pay for them. Because I never liked consulting when COVID hit um, and we got hit very hard because a lot of our business development, a lot of our business was face to face. I kind of saw that like, this is the opportunity. I'm going to go and start actually doing something that I probably personally enjoy more. And so that's when the YouTube started in March, 2020. The more I began looking into it, the more I kind of realized that there is a big gap out there in people sharing, um, information about this from position of any any kind of experience or any kind of knowledge. I think, you know, in 2020, 2021, the world of investing just blew up globally, right? So we had um, people sat at home with excess money. So people started suddenly paying down credit for the first time ever. Um, people started saving and investing money at a huge rate that's never happened before. At the same time as all that happened, all the new investing apps turned up like the Robin Hoods and the trading to one twos and the whatever, like all these popular apps turned up out of nowhere. and 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 they were free and very easy and very accessible. You know, you didn't need 5,000 quid to start investing. A lot of the finance YouTube space got very, very busy with, uh, how shall I put it politely? Um, people who perhaps um, do not quite really always know what they're saying. And I'm not saying that I necessarily know everything, but but it, you sometimes watch some of the content and you just you, you just hold your head in your hands and just say like, what is this? People really oversimplify. People oversimplifying, people treating investing like it's some kind of game or like it's some kind of team sport or like it's some kind yeah. of- Team sport, I like that. Uh, yeah, like they belief. think it's a team sport. Yeah, the, 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 the whole social media um, relationship with investment is bizarre. So you have people who um, they, you know, they think that investing in a stock is like joining a fan club. So you have to go and uh, 
decide that you like a company. And from that point onwards, you need to buy the scarf. You need to buy all the paraphernalia. Yet you can only ever say good things about it. You can't ever entertain that anything could possibly be wrong. The CEO is a god from that point onwards. You all bow down and worship him, however many times is necessary. And you know, um, and they don't talk about the risks. Oh no, 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 like no. What could you're go not wrong. allowed to assess the risks. You're not allowed to. Um, say, oh, the, you know, these decisions over here, like these parts of the business are maybe bad parts of the business. Those decisions are maybe bad decisions. I think if you if you don't understand the major downsides or the major risks of the companies that you invest in, if you don't genuinely think there are like significant risks and significant downsides, you're not investing, you're just in the fact. Well, world. if you've not valued the business, all you've got is hope, right? Exactly. So I think that's why the belief point comes in. Like, and it's <laughs> like, it's more of a religion than it is math at that point. Yeah. Can, could I ask you a pretty direct question then? Yeah. So you know the stats, you know how hard it is to invest. Why do you think that you can beat the market? Well, this is the thing. Um, I say in many of my videos on YouTube, um, the vast majority of people should not be investing um, in stocks. It should be just, uh, not, not in individual stocks, should be investing just in a broad, broad market index. index. Yeah. But I also know that a lot of people, even though they get told this, will not do it anyway, um, me included. <laughs> so so uh, my, my, my kind of objective is, well, I'm going to try to do my best to try to share some of the the process, some of the analysis, some of the thinking uh, with, with other people who are like-minded. For me personally, I'm just like, I'm happy with where I am. But the thing is, my situation is probably very different to most of the audience that I have. You know, I'm, I'm very aware of that where, if I lost um, the investments that I have, I reckon I'd be all right. But, you know, I have uh, a business with multiple, multiple different sides to the business, and that is the business growing. is the biggest investment. And and, and ultimately, yeah. And I, and I say this to people, and um, I make occasional videos about this. They're the videos that get absolutely no views because nobody cares. Nobody's interested in the simple fact that the the best way to have a really large investing portfolio is to make a lot of money. If you go and invest in this broad market index at 10%, but you put in a million quid, your portfolio is going to do better than getting 25% return, but putting in 200 quid a week or a month or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so you want to invest in an in individual company. What do you do? Yeah, there's only there's, it, there's only two things, but each of those probably takes quite a while. First, you've got to decide um, w w what price you're happy to buy in at. And then compare that to what the price is today and uh, to determine what the upside is. And that's the process going to take you a long time, but uh, it's relatively simple. It's, you might really like the company. You might not really like the price uh, and vice versa. Um, sometimes you, you might want to invest in a company you don't particularly like, but you think it's very undervalued um, and therefore you feel there's an upside in there. And then the second thing is you've got to know when you're going to sell. Um, because that could happen in two months or in three months. It could happen in 10 years. You don't know. Um, and again, that's going to be driven by evaluation. And the, the way you would value a business is if you were like a, a lot of people, when they invest in stocks, they don't treat it like they're buying a business, but that is exactly what you're doing. You're buying a small share of business, but let's say you're buying the whole thing. Like you're buying a corner shop. You would want to go through the books. You would want to go and see exactly how those books have changed over time. What are the different trends in the local area? What is the demand for the types of products that the um, corner shop sells? Is there stuff that the corner shop does not sell but could be selling where there's a potential upside that is not yet being materialized? Is there a general re regeneration in the area? Is there actually something happening in the city where long term there's a potential less footfall that's going to be hitting? You could... You should do all these same things with investing in a, in a company because you're becoming a part owner of that business. So you would want to go and build a valuation model. And valuation model can come in very different guises. I tried to do a bit more work by building a bottom-up model where you would take each single part of the business, each business line, each single revenue stream the company has and try to figure out how that revenue stream is being generated what are the drivers of that is it you know s selling a particular service what is the monthly price for the different options what is the propensity for that price to change over time what is the propensity for people to buy the various different products that the company um, sells how is that going to change in the future um, and basically 
model all of those different things out and then just add them up to figure out what the overall business metric is going to be because each of those business lines will have its own cost base and um, the overall business will have its general costs it will have its marketing costs you know like how do those marketing costs relate to the number of people who will be buying the products is there a performance marketing budget that directly brings people in is there a general brand marketing budget that they're always going to be spending how is that going to change over time as the company grows so Real simple. <laughs> Real simple. <laughs> Two simple steps. Just knock it together. I think people need to rethink investing uh, in many, many, many cases out of what I see because a lot of people do think it is really simple. And the, the, the fact is, it, it isn't. And that's why most people should not be investing. And I, it, it's very weird because in I do. I do an, yeah, I do an invest. Yeah, sorry. I do, I do run an investing channel or financial management channel and it's probably it's probably it probably very much goes against what i do you know, i'm making a course where i'm going to try to sell the analytics kind of like learning to people but i'm saying that most people shouldn't be doing it and, and that's because that's the case most people don't have the time to do it most people don't have the skills to do it um, you know a lot of people are not very comfortable with just making a little basic table in Excel, let alone build a whole model in it, for example. Um, and that's probably just the most basic version that you might build. You might want to build more sophisticated things to run scenarios, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, most people should, should probably steer clear if you're not prepared to do some version of that. Because if you're just basing your investing decisions off what you've heard from somebody else, even if you trust that person, that person might have wildly different risk tolerance to you. They might have a wildly different situation. They might be happy to lose all their money uh, because in a different scenario, they will make a huge return. Their risk re like reward ratio is very different to yours. You might not be very happy at all losing all of your investments. It might be a life-changing amount of money to you. you know, they might be earning a lot of money. You might not be earning a lot of money. Uh, so they, they're they going to be just fine. You're not. So so it, it's, it's huge... You can't just listen to what somebody else is doing and copy what they're doing because they're likely to be in a different situation to you. And if you don't do your own homework, what are you doing? You're just, you're just gambling. You, just, you, you found a stock. You found a ticker symbol. You found a price. It's $100. Like, how do you know if you should invest in it or not? Because some random guy on YouTube said so? I mean, like, smack yourself in the face. Yeah. Uh, like, it's just not the way to do it. Yeah. Pop quiz to Maine. Can you guess what the number one question is that I get asked most often? Mm. If the moon exploded, would we feel it immediately? <laughs> That's a ridiculous question. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's what to invest in. But you're not allowed to tell them, are you? No, because I'm not a financial advisor. But then that always is followed up by, okay, who should I actually speak to then? And I have to say, you know, I don't know. But that's actually where our new sponsor comes in, who I like because they handle this problem for you. I'm biased. I am, thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah, the reason I like Unbiased is they're not financial advisors, they're a platform. They have over 27,000 FCA regulated financial advisors that they can introduce you to based on what you need. So what can they help me with? You're a lost cause, mate. Oh, cheers. But for, for normal people, they can, you know, loads of things. So personal finance hygiene, investment savings. For me personally, I'd be using them for the big things, mortgages, tax planning, retirement. The big things. Yeah, and the first consultation's free. You can speak to an expert and take it from there. And if there are any fees, they're completely upfront about them. If you've got questions about money and want to speak to a qualified advisor, head to unbiased.co.uk forward slash making money. That way, they know you came from us. There's a link in the description. How, how long does it take you to build a model around Tesla? Yeah, yeah um, a long time. So I think a lot of people... Uh, so, so, so for me, if you're investing in a company... Uh, just just deciding which company Let, let's say let's say you've decided to analyze a particular company like there's time that it will take you before you even get there just to kind of weed some out by filtering or whatever what's that process um well, yeah so so let's say you, you're going through the financials you're just quickly filtering things where you you want companies in particular times and everyone has their own approaches or their own filters but, but let's say you identified you want to value a business right um you, you will need to go and read through all of their 
like recent 10 Qs or 10 Ks, you need to go and read all the different SEC submissions outside there. Sorry, I've got to ask, what are 10 Qs? Keep, keep him on his toes. <laughs> what are 10 Qs and what are 10 Ks? Sorry, so um, 10 Qs, 10 Ks are the, the quarterly and the annual submissions They're to like the, the SEC or really to the whatever. The, the official report. Like the yeah, investors report. Yeah, yeah, yeah like so, so, so every quarter they release the results and um, th there's a longer, so there's a short version that they publish and that everyone talks about in social media, then there's a much longer, more in-depth version with more stuff that gets sent to the ACC that nobody reads, even though that has a lot of stuff that is not in the short version that you really should read. I mean, like, you know, there can be a hundred pages or whatever or stuff. A lot of it is fluff and a lot of it is just copy and pasted the same the same paragraphs over and over, but you still need to read to check that um, nothing, nothing's changed or if there's a new line somewhere. So um, you filter the businesses, yeah. you then go, okay, I want to value this business. You consume all of the documentation that exists around that and you're doing that every quarter. Yeah, so, but even before you do that, right? So you, you, got, you, got, you got to go and assess all of the past stuff from a company, go and build a model. And for me, building a proper bottom-up model as an, a model where you're not just taking the last, I don't know, five years worth of revenues and just saying, oh, I'll apply a 30% growth rate or something. If you're building a real model, valuing a business from first principles, like what each individual business line, trying to understand like what, what are the drivers behind Every P and L line in that. Could you business. give us a real example to Tesla? Like uh, what? Yeah, so 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 like Tesla is one of the companies in my portfolio, and like in my model, I'd be looking at um, individual factories, individual potential factories. Production what are lines. the timelines? The like production lines within individual factories. What how are, many cars do you think that production line will yes. make in a given year? Yeah, well, how many cars will that make? What what are the different optics around each different factory? So, for example, like what what do the margins look like in China versus what do the margins look like in Texas versus what would the margins look like if they started a factory in Brazil or in Indonesia or in India? All these like potential sites that they're developing. Like like how does that look differently to Germany? What are the risks of unionization in terms of like pays and how do you get this accurate data like if um, you're looking so, at how so much you, would it be in brazil yeah, how so are you going to figure the, that out so this is this is a good question the idea with all of this is um always try to minimize um the overall error so trying to figure out like um I, i'm never trying to like get it perfect but I, but i think i'm trying to get orders of magnitude and trying to say okay well if i do a top down and a top down model is one way you just take the overall numbers and just extrapolate and try to figure it out and the problem with that is let's say you're signing like a 30% growth rate for five years. If you just change that to a 35% growth rate and you don't really know which one's right, the difference in 10 years time is going to be significant. Like a re, like the diversity is going to be compound, huge. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you, if you do bottom up, you can often reduce some of that error by kind of saying, okay, well, you know, like this production line, it might produce 10% more cars or 20% more cars or whatever at max capacity. It's probably unlikely to produce 10 times as many cars as whatever you're trying to model. And often, like sometimes there is a risk of being on the wrong side um, with all of your forecasts. But if you're trying to do best reasonable estimate as a baseline before you do variations, before you do probabilities on, on top of that, you, you, you are probably going to benefit from some of the errors cancelling each other out as well. Um, yeah, because if you apply a top down and you, you add, you're out, that multiplier applies to everything exactly. within the whole lot. Whereas what you're saying is there's a margin of error and, that you can and, get. And, and a couple of errors in, in a top down model because, so, so let's say your costs are too low and your like revenue growth is too high. The multiplication of those two together can be like orders of magnitude, like it can be a two or three X difference to your target price. Whereas in, in, in the scenario we're trying to work out like what, what would the average cost be? Okay, maybe you're going to be a bit out on wages here or a bit out on something else over there. But ultimately at the end of the day, um, you, you're pro you, you still like, you, this is the thing, like you, you can be the most accurate forecaster in the world, but you, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you, a lot of your um, guesstimates are going to be wildly wrong because things happen companies don't do what you think they're going to do companies screw up or companies outperform significantly what you think they're going to do um, out of nowhere so, so so you can never you can never know for sure you're just trying to at any one point just try to say if if you were buying the business how, um, how much would you pay and i think a lot of people don't necessarily do this exercise because there are businesses that that i love but i would not pay the current share price for that business because i think it's like way too expensive um it's like if you know you, you go to a shop there might be a brand of whatever it is that you like, beer or whatever that you really like, but it's, 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 50 it's double the price of everything else. So yeah. you're not going to buy it. Mm. And same here, like um, 
people say, oh, you don't believe in the company. I'm like, oh, I believe in lots of companies, but not that um, price. <laughs> say like I held AMD stock for a long time and I sold it. This is the only position I sold this year. Um, and I love the company. I, I'm, I use their products. I buy their ridiculously priced processors because they give me the performance I need in my work and stuff like that. Like I'm a big fan of what Lisa Sue is doing over there. I sold the stock because I felt that it reached my target price and I didn't have any more upside left. And like the, that, that, that's the only, and, and I think that's probably an even bigger thing. Um, the choosing when to buy is, is half of the <laughs> half of the package, but a much more difficult thing I think for most investors is trying to decide when, when should you sell because a lot of people just think just are in this fan club mentality. I will never sell this stock because diamond hands. Yeah, yeah, diamond hands. You know, got to hold all the way to the top, and then you just sit there, and then the, the stock at some point collapses back down, or something happens, or the thesis changes. Could you give the example of Lucid Motors? Because I know this is a good example that kind yeah. of can run through that. <laughs> yeah, so I held, I held a very small position in Lucid because early on, when it, it's a very difficult company to value, and I had a small position because. Very, it's a very, it was a very high risk, uh, risk stock because um, a new company uh, that went public via a SPAC that never produced a car. They make EVs. They, they, they make like EVs. Um, a lot of risks, a lot of uh, potential problems. However, the company um, had a lot of f things going for them, which others in the space did not. They had virtually unlimited funding because they were backed by Saudi Arabia. They still are um, their majority shareholder. So, uh, the, you know, in terms of startups, the, the, the most common reason people go under is they run out of funding they and they can't, they, they can't get the funding rounds done and stuff like that. So, you they know- They poached the guy from Tesla as yeah, well. Yeah, so they? The, 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 they, they poached a guy who was in the early design team or apparently heading up that team, uh, question marks as to exactly what the exact definition or who exactly was heading up. But anyway, uh, when the first Model S was designed, but um, so, so they poached a bunch of other people as well. So like they, they seem to get the right people in place. They seem to have- they, they they got a good space in Arizona. They built a what, by all accounts, is a pretty decent factory over there. They, they had a lot of things going for them, things which most of the other startups in the space did not have. I felt it was quite decent. It was a very speculative bet um, in the sense that I knew that my valuation was likely to be highly like out, uh, depending on, on what happens. But I had a valuation, and um, the stock... For some reason, I think I think just uh, EVs became really popular, just ran up. Um, Every car and, company, yeah, yeah was, and it like, to, like Neo, all of that was that period. So I was buying it. I can't remember what it was, like 10, 15 bucks. Um, well, the spot price is 10. Yeah. So it, I think it was about 11, 12 at the time. <laughs> yeah, so I was buying a lot um, early on and, and and then and then they ran up and I sold at 40 and I got <laughs> I got the usual fanboy hate, like, no, you don't believe in the company. Um, <laughs> That's exactly what they sound like, by the way. What's, what's, the, what's the stock now? Like four? Yeah. Four dollars now? Yeah. And, you know, like, I should have lost money on that one. I, sh I should have absolutely lost 100% of my position on that one or, or, or whatever I would have lost if I was selling now, uh, maybe 70%. Um, because it like all, all the, despite all the good things, the company is just significantly underperforming and... There's a lot. There's a lot more warning flags and red flags now um, that are more visible um, than there were back then. So I should have lost money on that one. But because I guess of this approach where I will always sell at the target price, I still managed to collect an upside and trip on my money for no reason, like just just nice. luck. I think there's something counterintuitive, or some people think it's they don't quite wrap their head around when you invest. What you're saying is the valuation is the point that I might sell at. Yeah, a lot of people talk about target price. And I think this is one where I use the same term because it's a term that people kind of understand, but I probably mean something slightly different because for a lot of people, their target price is what they think a stock is going to be at a particular point in time. And there's two big problems with that. One, you don't know what the stock price is going to be ever. And two, you certainly don't know exactly when that's going to happen. So when people say my, my target price is, $500 in 2025, I always just look at it and go, like- Means nothing. But Doesn't what, work what, like what that. does that even mean? So for me, it's very simple. It's probably far simpler than what all of this stuff is, which is, I think I value a company and I it's always present value. And I think like, if I was buying that company today based on my best estimate for me, um, what would be a fair price at which I'll buy it? Um, and if the current share price is significantly lower, then I feel that I'm buying a company at a discount. And if the bigger the discount, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Will it ever sell at full price? Maybe. 
Sometimes it does. And when it does, when it reaches what I think is a fair value, I'll sell. It doesn't necessarily mean that I have to wait 10 years and then sell the current value, the, the, the valuation it was when I first bought, because the valuation will change over time. So um, I might be buying a stock today, and this has happened with some companies in a big way. When I was buying AMD a long time ago, I certainly did not have valuation at which I sold today. And the, the same is likely to happen in the future. Like it could go up, it could go down. There are companies where I had a much higher initial valuation, but things happened. Um, the future projections are much lower today but the price is also much lower today. And I might be, I may have been buying very close or at the current target some time ago, but if I'm continuing to buy today and I still think that there is a significant upside, I, 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 people often think, oh, the stuff you did in the past matters, but it, it, it really doesn't. You just got to execute. It's like, it's like when you play particular games as a strategy, you just execute the same thing over and over and it's so boring, but that's what gets the returns. It doesn't matter that you bought that stock at four times the price like two years ago. If you think still today that it is actually good, like, you know, based on numbers, not based on sentiment or because you believe in the company or whatever, um, th then you should continue doing it. Um, and sometimes you get rewarded very heavily for it and sometimes you will not. Um, the average is is, is, what, is, what, is what you're playing at. Um, and, and trying to understand like the valuation will shift over time, but your valuation, like, and, and there's always a bit of R to it because if a stock runs up and it is 5% off your target price, should you sell or should you not sell? Well, I mean, it depends. depends. Like, it's, 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 a, it's a complicated question. Like what other upsides are you seeing in other stocks? How many other stocks in your portfolio? Is there a better opportunity? Should you put your money to work elsewhere? Are there bigger risks elsewhere? So, so, so it's, it's not necessarily, you don't have to wait exactly to the penny yeah. for the target price, but you have to, you know, if one of them has run up and everything else has a huge upside, well, yeah, I mean, I'll, t I'll shave a little bit off. I'm happy to take a bit low, a bit less um, and redistribute. Um, so it kind of, it, it, it does vary. How how time consuming is your process? I mean, if you invest in an index fund, you just leave your money there and you just put it in every month. Exactly. Yeah. How many like hours. stocks do you have? And then yeah, how many hours do you have on each stock? Like if you have like ten, for example, in your portfolio, how on a day to day, how how does that look for you? Yeah. So so my portfolio is usually quite tight. So I probably only ever have up to about um, up to ten positions, um, major positions. I think at the moment it's seven, um, and then some smaller ones, um, but. With each stock, I would say every quarter, if you invest in a company, every quarter, you have to at least read all the like the PowerPoint presentations, the releases that they do, the the 10Q forms with the SEC. You have to read everything else that they publish as well, all the news, all the like uh, appointments, etc. cetera. Um, you have to read stuff about the industry. You have to read stuff about what the competitors are doing because they're going to directly impact the performance of the company as well. And preferably, you want to read the main competitors official financial filings too, so that you understand exactly what's happening. I'd say to properly read all of that stuff every quarter, um, you, you know, just to read the forms by the company, you're probably talking two, three, four hours a quarter. Then to read all the other stuff from everyone else, it's another two, three minimum. I also want to caveat five. this by saying that like you did this for a job and you yeah. graduated from Oxford with a maths degree. It comes a little bit quicker to you. To most people, <laughs> deciphering these documents takes a Maybe. little while. I read one of these it's documents. Not... It probably take me like six hours. Do you know what I mean? Just to like absorb it um, because... You know, that's not, not my skill set. I can tell a dick joke on a finance video pretty well, but that's, <laughs> that's my skill set. Like, but, you know, I think it comes quickly to you, you know. Well, may, maybe, and I guess, like, we're, we all need to take advantages of the... Um, Our talents. Of, ...of the unfair advantages that we have. <laughs> but um, but I'll say, yeah, so, so you're probably doing at least, I would say, seven to ten hours of reading minimum per, per company. company. Then the model, like, the first time you build is going to be a long amount of time then you maybe are just doing adjustments or improvements or fixing a few things or whatever it is and you know when you're doing that um, maybe it's only two to three hours a quarter to go and adjust your model L let's say you only do one major update um, to your model every quarter but then you need to listen to the earnings call because um, stuff gets said on the earnings call that is neither in the 10Q or any presentation or anything, and they answer live questions from analysts where they might um, give away something that isn't printed anywhere else. So you need to listen to that. That's an hour and a half to two hours on top Is of that. Is the earning well. call between? 
Um, earnings call. Now, the earnings call is when the company does a live call after they've published the results, where they go through the results and then they answer some questions that people have submitted. And then they, you, typically the format is then they answer some live questions from some select analysts that they like. Um, so yeah, so that's another, um, let's say two hours um, to do that of time. So when you add that up, you know, it's a full-time you, job. You've got a YouTube well, channel, well, so like yeah, you, that, you don't 20, work nine to five. So yeah. for the average person working nine to five, is this is this realistic? Yeah, well, well, that's, nine, that's, like, that's, five well, 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 that's, pro that's probably five. Um, you know, it's probably 20, 20 hours a company a quarter, right? So let's say you're invested in a relatively small portfolio. Ten, ten is relatively small, yeah. right? You know, you know, that's two hundred hours a quarter for you. For, well, for, for you, yeah, so not for the average, average like Four Britain. Yeah, so yeah, it might yeah, be yeah, a bit more for yeah, the average yeah, person yeah. who. Not for Rain Man over here. Yeah, like, exactly. Right? <laughs> no, but, but you know, like, and, that, and that's before accounting for anything else you're going to be doing in terms of actually earning money. And I, I don't think most people have 200 hours every three months no. that they can possibly. And, and I'm saying that's the bare minimum. Because if you're if you're going a bit further, if you're actually going to be diving more, or, uh, what about the process of trying to discover new companies, not the ones that you're already invested yeah. in? The screening process, or yeah. managing your, your portfolio, and trying to decide, like you know, is there a macro reason why you should be redistributing or moving money around or anything else like that? I, I probably spend far more time analyzing companies that I do not invest in, hmm. um, just because like the, the, there are too many things I don't like, or I think the valuation is too rich, or you know, there are companies that I used to be invested in that like I I, I held in position in NVIDIA for a long time. I think actually very early on in my channel, like one of the very early investing videos I did was I sold my position in NVIDIA. So by that point, I already held it for a long time and ran up. And um, yeah, it's, it's run up even more because we've had the AI bubble since then. And obviously, you know, you, you're never going to be able to always time the peak or whatever. Mm. But, um, but th there are companies where they're doing well now and I used to own them. I don't own them now. That it, I, th I think the, this mentality that the stock market is about um, playing games or trying to win or something. I'm, I'm like, it's, it's, it's a method for getting a return on my money. I'm putting my money to work in these companies. And um, you know, like some years you have a bad year. Like I had a pretty bad year last year. Um, I think most people had a pretty bad year last year. Um, um, generally, because of my in investment in individual stocks, when the stock market does badly, I do significantly worse. When the stock market does good, I tend to do a bit better on yeah. average. Um, so, so you know, just in uh, last year, I think I, I think the stock market went down a bit, but I, I went down what was it, thirty five, forty percent, something. Um, you know, Tesla collapsed by a factor of four. So <laughs> it could have been worse. Um, but but in other years, like like this year, I think so far the port the same portfolio is outperforming the market by three or four times. It's, it's, it's swings and roundabouts, and I'm not here for a quick 100%. I'm not interested in... Do you enjoy the process? I like, enjoy you, the process. You enjoy it all? Yeah, um, because that's it, because I seem like the, your portfolio, portfolio makes me want to go gray and like lose my head. So Tomaine, you work in venture capital now, don't you? They call me, I do. They call me the modern day Deborah Meaden. Plastic Profita, more like. <laughs> Pitch us our new sponsor, Sensei, here you go. Take okay, it. great. Well, Sensei started off in Harley Street. Um, it was a machine used to treat PTSD. And essentially it started off as a big vibrating sound bed. And um, it's really used to treat the vagus nerve, which connects the brain to the stomach. Um, and essentially it manages your, your reaction, your body's reaction to stress. Is that why they say you feel sick to your stomach when you're stressed? That's right, who's pitching who here? Just channeling my inner Peter Jones for you, mate. Anyway, they miniaturise this massive machine into a device called Sensate. So you put it on your chest for 10 to 30 minutes. It comes with an app, which plays you nice, relaxing meditation music. Kick back, relax, it relieves some anxiety, get a nice little kip, bosh, job done. So how do people find out more? If you struggle with anxiety and want to try Sensate, head to getsensate.com slash making money and use the code MM10 to get 10% off. Crypto makes you a bit strong because you can see like an 80% loss and be like, well, that's that. <laughs> but like to have to monitor it every day or not every day, but like to have to be aware of all of your different stocks and do all this reading and all this, and like you like you said, you lose 40%, like it's, stre it's stressful. It, I think it would be for most people because especially um, people who have not been through it before. Mm. So I remember like the thing that really got me into investing it's it's an interesting anecdote, um, and I'll tell you without naming names. But Name I was working <laughs> at I was working at a big American bank um, during the financial crisis. Um, I ended up walking out of that bank with my cardboard box with my stuff in it. Um, so so I've been I've been on that um, on that train. 
But at one point, um, on the morning when um, Lehman collapsed, um, all the bank stocks were being destroyed mm -hmm. in the stock market. And um, I sat relatively close to a a pretty senior guy in the in the, in the overall bank, and I remember seeing um, because you know this was outside any kind of disclosure periods or anything like that. We didn't have weren't privy to any insider info or anything, but just the stock goes down from I can't remember what it was like from sixty to three dollars or something like that, um, and the guy just goes and buys <laughs> like a, a pretty reasonable six figure amount off the stock at three dollars, and I'm sitting there going. I'm just observing because I, 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 I'm a graduate, you know, on a graduate salary, uh, just watching this. And I'm like, and trying to understand the mentality. And the mentality is very much like, like everyone's panicking. The stock is just collapsing for no particular reason. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the bank. There's nothing like in any of the disclosure. There's nothing in the documents and nothing in the numbers. But when the market is panicking, so you go and, you go and do the opposite of what all, um, all the people running around, waving their hands in the air are doing. Um, I think the stock price is now... I can't remember, it's 115 or something. Um, I've never seen someone make that much money in such a short space of time. Um, <laughs> probably even since then, just um, live, um, sitting next to them. And I, and, and, and this, I, that, that's kind of when I really began understanding the mentality properly. Um, and I think a lot of people have not been through that necessarily, especially some of the newer investors where you kind of like, stuff goes down, stuff goes up um, long term. Um, it, it sounds incredibly simple, right? Long term, the strategy is you, you, you buy low, sell, <laughs> you buy low, sell high. Doing it is so hard. Mm -hmm. Like talking about it, super easy. But doing it because you know, like the stock goes down, and I was like, oh my god, you made a mistake. You know? sell, sell, and, sell. and then the stock sits de down for a year, for two years, for three years. Sometimes you invest in a company that is a great company. The company actually performs incredibly well, continues performing incredibly well for years, and the stock never goes up. Because sentiment is a thing, market and like the market it. doesn't like it, and the investors do, like that will happen. Sometimes a company that doesn't deserve to go up will go up. That will also happen. Um, and and kind of understanding that it's a mix of an of art and science is is really really important because a lot of people think it's purely one or the other, and and it's like the, you need to understand that there's a huge element of luck in it. Um, but a bit like with poker, you need to build the science where you play knowing that there is a luck element but knowing what you do when luck goes for you or against you um and i think if you the moment you stop um understand like stop understanding that in the true sense um you, you you probably you've probably lost and you shouldn't be investing in stocks the, the thing so to to kind of like caveat that as well you talk about the guy and the example of him buying into yeah. the bank i think a lot of retail investors really bought into the buy the dip narrative and like they 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 throw in they go into the fire, but they they haven't got the other side of it. But by the dip, because you, you know, um, you, you go and look at some of the cases recently because everyone was into. I didn't really ever understand this, but everyone went crazy on AMC and GME, and I'm looking at it, yeah. and I'm sitting there going, I just fundamentally do not compute. I'm like, a company is valued on nothing to do with numbers. <laughs> um, like you like you think you're gonna outsmart the hedge funds. Um, because you think that you know how shorts work. I, I think this episode is probably nowhere near long enough for us to actually go into how shorts can unwind without them having to buy back everyone's stock. Yeah. But anyway, um, so everyone, everyone's sitting there kind of thinking, okay, well, how do we, um, how do we play, play this game? How do we make 1,000% quickly? And I'm sitting there going, like, what, what are you guys doing? And then the stock begins going down and begins going down further. And I was like, oh no, we're, we're going to buy the We're going to become multi-billionaires. And I'm sitting there going, oh no. Like the company is literally printing a new share class and selling it to you because they know that you're chumps and you're going to buy it anyway. <laughs> and, and you and then you do. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? So like you said, you spend around 200 hours a month. No, a quarter. A quarter. A quarter, about 200 hours a quarter, like re uh, researching your stocks and building your models. How do you have time for that when you have your job? And a kid. Well, I, I, and a kid. Yeah, I, I, have, I have two two unfair advantages over many other people, I think. So one is my job is directly linked to the investing that I do. Most For most people, that is not the case. So I can go and value companies and then I can go and discuss that um, in making content. 
I can go and share my opinion uh, because that's also extra information and I earn money from ad revenue, etc. So for most people, that's not the case. Um, so you, you you don't earn your income in the same way as you manage your investments. So the, the hours are separate. For me, they're a bit more ingrained. But also, I just, um, yeah, I, I work a reasonably high number of hours. Um, there are many times when I'm working early. Um, I get into the office very early. And I work through, then I go back, do bedtime, etc. Then I come back to the office, um, do the evening shift, um, drive home at 2 a.m., sleep, repeat. Um, and I'm okay with that. Most people probably would not be okay with that because, I mean, most people have a life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, and, and I think time is the biggest, the most undervalued factor in all of this, I think by people, um, people just think, oh, I can, I can quickly go and do stuff, but you can, and maybe it'll work out uh, for you. There's a reason why the vast majority of active investors underperform um, the stock market. And, and, and the reason is part because it's, it's just extremely hard to do, but part because a large number of these people, including the fund managers, um, don't do their homework. And the reason the fund managers don't do their homework is because a lot of people think, oh, you know, um, this guy's running a, a whole fund. They have all these analysts and computers and stuff like that. But it's not their money. Um, well, it's not the money, but most people don't understand how a fund manager makes the money. They don't care Assets if under, the stock yeah. market goes up or down. Yeah. Yeah. They make their fees. They're just so charge you if they way. talk about a company that's nobody heard of that might be, you know, doing some cool mining somewhere in Australia or something, nobody cares. Kathy would make Nobody will give them money. Yeah. But if you're invested in all the popular stocks, everyone's going to give you money, irrespective of what those stocks do. Uh, because they like Tesla and they like Palantir and they like NVIDIA and whatever else is popular at the moment, right? So, um, so, so it's important to understand that like all those active fund managers underperform the market, but that doesn't necess that, that's kind of part of they don't care. That's part of their strategy. <laughs> yeah. um, some fund managers are there to make long-term returns for their customers. Most fund managers probably are not. They're there to earn fees. Um, and that's what they do. And it doesn't really matter what the past performance is uh, that, that much. Because when the stock market goes up, even if you're underperforming, you're still going to get returns. You can still print, you know, I got 8% in that year. Um, most people are not savvy enough to actually even compare to what the average of the S&P 500 was in that year or whatever. Mm -hmm. They just look at it and go, oh, well, this fund earned an average of 8% over the last five years. And like, yeah, the S&P 500 did twice that. I mean, you know, so what? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's it's extremely important to kind of understand what drives the the the, the different people in in the active investing community. Um, some people like me, like you, you watch a YouTuber talk about stocks. That YouTuber earns revenue from you watching them talk about stocks. Um, they're going to talk about popular stocks because that's the stuff that people want to watch. It doesn't mean they're the best stocks to invest in. It doesn't mean that, that like those companies are going to get the best returns. It means that they're going to get enough views to get enough advertising revenue to pay their bills, and their sponsors are going to pay them more money. Now you've got to think about what why people are doing things, um, and often those things are not in your best interest. They're in that person's best interest. Mm -hmm. It's really important to understand also that just because a company is popular does not necessarily mean that it is a bad investment or a good investment, it's kind of irrelevant. There are companies that do extremely well that are really popular, and there are companies that go to zero that are extremely popular, and, and, and vice versa, right? So, so, so I kind of just ignore the hype as best as I can, because there are some stocks that I invest in that nobody cares about, and nobody follows, nobody talks about on YouTube. I tried in the past making a video about it, nobody watches it, so I don't talk about it. Um, and there are other companies they invest in that are extremely popular, and, and there's a spectrum. Um, and I think the best thing you can do is 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 to ignore the hype and and, and kind of not base your decisions based on the hype. And then watch our YouTube channel. <laughs> and watch my YouTube channel. Yeah, I'll talk about, about the stocks that everyone's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you think you always need like so much research, or can you sometimes be like make a like a judgment call? Like for example, like COVID or the yeah. airlines crash. You're like eventually we're going to fly again. I, I, do you think you can do that, or do you have to and be like okay, they're all seriously underpriced. Underpriced. I'll buy them and hold for a bit. I, I think it kind of depends in the way. I guess, I guess if you see a major major crash, which probably happens every COVID. forty years or something, 
And co- like COVID was one example where there was a flash crash, right? Yeah. Um, in 2008, every bank just went to zero. And the thing is, you, you can lose um, by playing that game as well because you could invest in a company that does eventually go to zero yeah. um, because of the factors. But very often the panic engulfs a much broader spectrum than actually en- it ends up getting affected by whatever is causing the panic. You know, in 87, when the stock, like, like sometimes there's just a, a weird scenario where there's an opportunity that doesn't happen very often. Um, but, but yeah, sure. Sometimes you, you can, pro- you should probably do some homework because often, you know, like the COVID scenario is played out how it has, um, it could have played out very differently, right? Mm-hmm. Like COVID could have been more like the 1918, whatever Spanish influenza or, or a stronger strain than that. Like we didn't really properly know at the time when everything began really crashing and going down. It could have been much worse. It could have been something where for the next decade, the travel industry is disrupted significantly, where we're all like working remotely and not going out for a much longer period. Like it could have, like it didn't, which is great. But um, there's always this kind of risk factor where you, you, you make a call and you say, oh, it's going to be like this. But you don't but know. You don't know. Um, and so the travel industry could have been hit even harder. Yeah. Um, it's possible, right? I made that judgment call without doing the research, but I bought Alphabet because it was like everyone's going to be locked indoors and that's the kind of business that, that's going to do okay either way. The airline, like you say, is a risky... I mean, Warren Buffett sold out of the airlines at that point and said, these businesses have changed. But people piled in, didn't they? So to me, that was like, I'm not going near airlines if that man's saying we <laughs> shouldn't be buying them. Well, yeah, I mean, and, or it could have been replaced by more local travel. Um, mm-hmm. It could have been replaced by whatever. Like, t- technology has a weird way of making jump uh, jumps as well. It could have been that a new form of travel that is faster, like, you know, a replacement for supersonic jets or whatever. And then the airline stocks do what the car stocks are doing today and getting absolutely destroyed. Um, uh, because they're not switching to EVs and EVs are just eating their lunch and in 10 years time those companies are going to be bankrupt um, like um, yeah it's difficult especially with these established industries where if there is a disruption it's difficult to understand whether the disruption is a, fl- is a short term effect that is going to go away or if it's the start of a, a larger disruption process is going to end up killing them um, and it, it's always easy in retrospect. It's often not so easy at the time. How do you price? How do you factor that into your modeling then? Um, well, you can, it's difficult to do it. So, so the way the way you would do that probably in a model is not so much in the actual direct valuing uh, process because you can't go and price in every single risk effectively into a bottom up traditional model. What you can do is you can do what um, um, you, you, you can run scenarios where you take the same model. And you build multiple different overlays where you're saying, what is the probability of these different scenarios playing out or these different risks playing out? And each of them might affect some of your assumptions. So this is why a bottom-up model is really great because um, it's easy to multiply things through. So if you go and say, okay, there is a productivity, a factory productivity jump where you know robots actually work on production lines in 2030. Um, You might say, okay, I don't know how likely that is, but I'm going to assign a relatively low likelihood of probability, but it could happen. So it's a low likelihood of probability, but the upside would be significant because it would significantly reduce labor costs. It would mean that the production line could be operating at three or four times whatever it is, the efficiency. So you might go and add that in. You'll have a whole suite of different scenarios, and this is how I do my valuations. So if you, if all of these different scenarios have probabilities, some of them are correlated, so you have to take account of that. Because, you know, like, if, if, if this happens, this is also likely to happen. Or the opposite, like, if this happens, this is highly unlikely to happen. So you've got to figure out how to build that in. Some of them are completely not really correlated at all. Like, there might be a macro scenario and might be a technological improvement scenario, which are really not like they both could happen or one could happen without the other or whatever so so you've got to build that in and then you just run a multitude of simulations over the distribution of the probabilities of all these different things and you might have you might have heard like um, people talk about kathy wood's arc invest because they published their monte carlo simulations which is something very similar to this which is basically just a run through the different spectrum of potential outcomes and based on that you get a a, a field almost of potential outcomes so you're saying okay instead of the share price is not my target share price is not a hundred dollars Maybe that's the average, but I, but I see that there's a big, um, big spike of like all these different things playing out. It's highly likely to be based on my assumptions somewhere in the 80 to 120. And that's quite narrow range. And if the price for that particular stock says today is 20, you'd be saying, okay, I'm, I'm pretty happy because I can see that 
after considering all these different things, there's quite a hefty you know, wedge over there with a significant, significant upside. On the contrary, you might, you might be saying, okay, like the middle ground is quite high, but there's also a very high chance that you're actually going to lose all your money. The company's going to go down. On average, over, long, over the long term, the numbers for me play out. And I always do the same thing. And I, like, I'll always buy on the same basis and I'll always sell on the same basis. Um, and whenever a company that I really like goes and hits my target and I think I look at my distribution, I'm like, okay, there's not much more that I'm going to be keep collecting here. I'll sell every time. And, and sometimes things happen. And, you know, this AI wave that we're seeing this year, you couldn't have seen that realistically coming, say, three years ago. Um, so, so you can't predict all of these things that happening. That's going to be my next question. But, like, have you had any huge unforeseen things come into your model? And oh, then oh, have you had to change your model as a result? Oh, always. And, and you adjust. The, the key is to adjust because my initial valuation uh, on a company can often be wildly different to what the final valuation of which I sell because you constantly adjust like my valuation on a stock that I invest say in 2015 or 2016 or whatever will be very very different to the valuation on the same company today because things happen and things change and the competitive landscape changes and the technology landscape changes and say in the last two years a lot of my valuations have come down significantly because companies have slowed down a lot of people also don't pay attention to that so you know, you know, if you think a company is going to do well, when it's going to do well is massively important because if it's five or 10 years later than um, what you think, um, the, the discounting will, will kill. It doesn't matter because if they only start doing well in 2040, in today's dollars, that might make it not very worthwhile of investment. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, I'll, I'll be invested for as long as it takes. Yeah. And so, they could have had that just in a bank account, generating a bit of interest on cash. And they, yeah. instead they're generating nothing in the market for all that there's, period. Yeah, there's a lot of these weird mathematical truths where you talk about it. and pe Like, for example, there's a big um, new trend of people saying, I'm invested in this one stock because I believe in this company the most. I think it'll do the best. Diversification. Um, for, diversification yeah. is for losers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, sounds uh, very risky. Uh, and I'm sitting there going, this is coming from what, you what, as well. What, <laughs> even if you're right, <laughs> even if you're right, even if it plays out for you, you you're mathematically f uh, far more uh, likely to do better if you um, divest between a, a, a number of different companies. And obviously, ideally, it would be a reasonably large number, but as we were talking about time, you're, you're always limited um, in time. And time is a variable that people overlook. But So, so you, can't, you can't go and realistically run a portfolio with so many companies in it. Not well. Because, because you're just going to be blindly investing, um, gambling. But if, you, um, but if you, say, carry five to 10 stocks, for example, um, even if some of those stocks don't, you don't, you don't have as much, I hate that word, conviction in them, or you think, you know, the upside is smaller or whatever. Um, if you go and invest the money into that company, um, it, you don't know which one is going to shoot out when. This is that point. Like the company that you think is amazing, it could take 10 years for that company to come through. Um, or, or you might be sitting there trading sideways for all that period. But when you invested, say, let's say, let's call it five, one of those could accidentally come through, right, next year, for whatever reason. There's a new tech thing that's happen that happens that your company is particularly favored by. So that company goes, you sell and you redistribute. Suddenly, that redistribution has inc significantly increased the positions in the companies, in the other companies in your portfolio, and you're waiting for them to come through. That effect of redistributing the winners gives you a huge long-term upside in terms of your portfolio performance that people just completely overlook. Um, because you, like, you can't predict exactly when, but if you have multiple different companies in your portfolio, the likelihood is they will peak or they will go up at different points. So that outlier effect on a portfolio basis. Exactly. exactly. And, and giving yourself the option to have outliers, because you might be invested in the best stock ever, but the stock market might just not agree with you. It's the same with YouTube, right? To simplify the example, I could say I'm going to make one video. It's going to be the best video I ever make and I throw it out there. Or I make 100 videos and then five of them randomly that I just don't know drive 50% of all of the growth on yeah. the channel. And it's a great example because you only have so much time. You can't, you can't go and make 2,000 videos no. because they're going to suck. Yeah. Right? So again, like you, you, you can only put so many fishing rods in, um, but putting just one in with the best bait is probably not going to be as efficient as having a few different approaches and a few different um, like st styles and seeing which one of them works best. Um, and this, yeah, um, I, I, I think people who argue against diversification just the, the math doesn't lie. And I, you, you, I, you can do a relatively basic 
proof of that by just just showing the typical distributions of the you know how long it takes for the um for, for the valuation to come through the, or, or for you to collect your upside and you know even as a long-term investor the likelihood is every now and then one of your companies will go up and you will sell like some years you will sell a lot in 20 in 2021 i sold most of my positions um because they all like the stock market went absolutely bananas um, <laughs> um and since then, uh, I've not sold very much at all. Like it, this year, I've only sold one position. I've like I've basically my, my portfolio has been doing nothing. And that's uh, the it, AI it, narrative. It, 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 it's so boring. Oh no, just the stock market is down. Um, the stock market um, f crashed last year. Most people don't really call it a crash. I mean, it, it went down 25 percent, right? Yeah. Um, then then it, it went. It's been going down this year as well. You just you can't see it because the eight AI stocks. Um, are propping it all up. If you if you strip them out, the stock market is actually down this year as well. And and I think most people just just look at the overall numbers and that narrative is not very popular. But like it's it, we're we're in a downturn and we're in at the end of the second year of that downturn. And if you look historically at downturns <laughs> and when a good time to invest in companies is, I mean, most people probably only really look at the big tech giants that are invested in Google and Facebook and Amazon and whatever. But there's a lot of other companies out there. Um, and a, a lot of them are beaten up at the moment. Um, and it's quite a long downturn we've had. I think, is it 10 months is the average? And we're like, I can't remember, like I can't remember the average years. I did the math at I some think point. It's 10, I went through. Months. Um, yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not very long. No. Uh, <laughs> from, from, from top to, to bottom. And yeah, um, I don't know exactly when, when the bottom is, but I, I just know it's, the, 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 the point I always make is when I go to the shop and there's a, chocolate bar on sale it's a really simple example because we always think about that example differently so it's normally two pounds and you come in and it's one pound now i personally go oh that's great it's my it's a chocolate bar that i place a lot of value in and i think it's massively undervalued so i'm going to buy it at one pound the popular investing mentality at the moment is i'm going mm, to wait maybe tomorrow is going to be at 95p and I'm sitting there going, okay. I mean, keep waiting. Like maybe, maybe you'll be back at two pounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I, I remember um, in December last year when Tesla stock crashed to a hundred dollars, and everyone began. It's very popular when the stock does really well. Everyone becomes a fan. When the stock does really badly, everyone becomes a hater. Um, it's a sort of the social media way of things with investing. But 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 everyone's saying, "Oh, it's going to go down even more. It's going to zero. It's all a scam." I hate Elon. I hate whatever. I'm like, okay, whatever. Uh, I, I I don't I don't play those games either way. I'm not. I don't play the fan games either. But um, but I was sitting there going, "Yeah, yeah." I mean, um. I think I, th I think it's really bad a really bad idea to invest in a stock like at a hundred dollars. There'll be plenty of opportunities to to come back and invest like an absolute boss at three hundred dollars instead. <laughs> You've got to wait until it's on the way up, man. You've got to wait until it's on the way up. Otherwise, you buy you, you're catching a falling knife. You know, this never is catch a falling knife. Such a popular yeah. argument right now. Oh no, it's on the way down. I'm like, yeah, some like if you're buying something that has a high likelihood of going to zero. Yeah, I mean that's a problem. If you're buying something where you genuinely like have a good reason to think that it is not going to zero, but is actually massively undervalued, could, there could be a slightly better point of, of buying in. But generally speaking, like I find w when you buy in in stuff where you feel it's massively undervalued, and so um, in stuff that is, uh, hits your price target, on average you do quite well. Did you buy more Tesla when it went to one hundred dollars? Oh yeah. Um, but was that in your model, or was that a reaction to the? The, no, no, the my model. Uh, no, no, I think I think my model actually my valuation went um, in that period. It went down from nine hundred dollars over over the space of like a year and a half to about seven seventy. I think. But you still saw seven seven times upside on a hundred, so you buy. Yeah, and, and 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 it's all about the upside. It's all about yeah. kind of saying what what, what, you, what you think. Um, and obviously, th there are always risks, right? There are there are risks that the regulators will turn against EVs because lobbying, because unforeseen energy pressures, because whatever. Um, there are risks that like um, the, the, the unionized uh, workers are gonna are, are gonna cause problems and there are risks that competitors actually show up um, instead of not showing up. I mean, a lot of people say, yeah, n n nobody else has a chance, but I, I, I always question that. It's like, like there's, there is always a chance that somebody else comes along. You know, if, if one company can do it, so can others. 
um, and, and kind of dismissing everyone else and just saying there's only one potential person who can do this is a very quick path to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's very easy to kind of just say there's only one, there's only one of, of anything. There will be others. Um, the question is when and how quickly they'll replace the current, the, the current, um, the current company that is breaking uh, the market will be the boring dinosaur incumbent in the future. Uh, that's going to be disrupted themselves, you know. <laughs> and and sometimes it's a hundred years, like what's happening with Ford. But Ford at one point was the the company that was building the first factories for cars, and absolutely, you know. And okay, that took a long time uh, for them to become the dinosaur. But these things do go in cycles. Um, and and not not thinking that at some point the company you invested in is going is 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 going to be worth selling. Is it's just a weird attitude. So T, you're going to start investing in some individual companies? Absolutely not. I'm looking good, forward to good for you. Um, yeah, Will, our producer, does the newsletter every week, and I'm just looking forward to him summarising what a Monte Carlo uh, distribution is, or whatever it's simulation. <laughs> Sorry, Monte Carlo simulation. So yeah, check out the newsletter and see Will's attempt at summarising this episode. I was, I, was, I was trying to make it simple, but oh no, it was fine. Probably... No, it was great. It was great. It, it's it, like it's what was needed. The whole point was to kind of show people the work that that is needed, and it's not simple. So you shouldn't oversimplify yeah. it because you're not doing it justice to the work that you do. You know, there's all of that. Look, the key, the key thing for me for this is, you are not in the market to make yourself rich. You're trying to get a return on your money. You could just buy an index, a broad index, and you will get that return on your money. You can go about your day and you can work and you can focus on the things you're good at. But if you've got a passion for investing, maybe you want to do it the way Sasha does, and that could work as well. There's a spectrum there. You don't. But going in and just buying individual businesses without doing the work that you're doing is gambling and you probably will then not even get what you would have got if, with a broad index. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a bit like, I don't know, um, learning to play. If you want to be a concert pianist, it's going to take you quite a while to get there and you're going to have to do a lot of work. And a lot of that work is going to be mind-numbingly boring. You know, you're going to be sitting there playing the scales. And like investing is the same as any other skill like that. Um, you're going to have to do a lot of work. A lot of it is going to be boring. If you don't want to do the work, you, you're probably not going to be a concert pianist. For most people, it's not the right choice um, for for a multitude of reasons. Most people shouldn't do it. If you want to do it, great. Or power. I know. I know most people listening will listen to say you shouldn't do it and do it anyway. That's how people are. That's wired. why I have ten percent of my portfolio that I do. That <laughs> I have. There's a hard and fast rule then because it, yeah. it, it, you, we all want to gamble. We all we all want to roll the dice. So I have a yeah. set limit of ten percent of my portfolio on the side that I do that with. Yeah, you just you just gotta. The, the key thing I think in in all of this is you've got to make sure that you are really genuinely deep inside happy with your choices. That you know if this all goes the wrong way you knew of the, the risk and you understood it because a lot of people say oh yeah, yeah i understand the risk and then it all goes south and oh no you know like all the people investing in the various like dog flavored <laughs> tokens and <laughs> nfts and stuff like dog that tokens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just just like I'm, I'm looking at what were you guys doing like i remember when the peak of that craze was um all the big youtubers started promoting all the flocky union whatever mm. i made i made some i made a video like immediately saying this is the dumbest shit I've ever seen in my life. Um, and since then, all of that stuff that was being promoted by the biggest influencers Huge. has gone down 99.9 whatever percent um, and is basically worthless. And, and I'm like, I wasn't, it wasn't rocket science. Um, it, it, was, it was really simple. It's just, if you took off your like, crazy i want to make fast money lens it, it wasn't it was they spoke about it because it got views exactly it's that point again they, exactly. the only reason they spoke about it was because people they got a load of views yeah and people just wanted to Graham chase fast money. made way more out of ad revenue on that than he ever did putting money into flocky you know or whatever yeah, it was yeah 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 um and it's it's sad but it, it and it's difficult as a content creator it's very difficult as a content creator to steer away from that because naturally you're always pulled into like you know that you could make a video on this and it would be super easy and quick you have to do very little research you can just sit there and talk and you can record the video and do the whole thing in two or three hours get which is a lot less you'll you get loads of views and you could but you um as with any business like my, my attitude here is I want to be doing this in 10 years time 
I'm not here for it. It's the same as investing, right? You lose a lot of integrity. Doing yeah, that. I, 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 I'm just happy just going uh, slowly in the slow lane. Flames. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, the flames are pretty. Pretty. I find them funny, and I think I think most of the yeah. long term viewers find them amusing because I started doing them as a joke, and then I kind of just st- just kept doing it uh, because well, they, uh, they work and they get people to click. But. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and everyone's doing the flames now. You yeah. kind of started that, I think. But yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely, well, thank pleasure. you for having We're me. We're going to go get some great. beers now. All yeah. of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's that's how, really why I came to London. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I'm here. <laughs> that's a wrap. Awesome. If all of that went completely over your head, then there's a link in the description to our newsletter where we kindly summarise everything we went over in the episode. And if you love this episode, trust me, you want to check out crap. <laughs> just hit the mic sorry that keep it keep it that'll do it's here just click this ignore that guy complete amateur <laughs>